Okay, yeah. Uh, can everyone hear me? Okay, good. So, uh, the title is Parametric Shortest Paths. Does this, okay, yeah, okay. Uh, in uh, planar graph, and uh, I'll define everything here shortly. So, this is a uh, joint work with my PhD guy, Jay Kumar. And yeah, he's not here right now. And I thought some of you might not have seen him. So, this is what he looks like. And before today, some of you might not have seen me, so this is what I look like. <laughs> and this is a collaborative effort between the two of us. Okay. So yeah, let's start. Uh, so before I get into parametric shortest paths, let me just explain the shortest path problem. So uh, suppose this is your, uh, the roadmap of your city, and that's your home, and that's your office. And there are many ways to get from home to office, so this is one of them. This is another, and in this particular scenario, there are six possible ways, and you want to get to, to work as soon as possible, okay? And all these uh, roads, okay? Okay, first, first of all, I should mention they are all one-way streets in the sense all the uh, horizontal roads go from left to right, and all the vertical roads go from down to up, okay? So you want to get as soon as possible, and the numbers on the uh, roads indicate uh, the amount of traffic on them. And the cost of a path is simply the sum of the amount of traffic on their constituent roads. So this is just, uh, I'm just stating the standard shortest path problem. In this case, you just compare all the numbers. 150 is the smallest number, so P4 is the shortest path, okay? So this is the general shortest path problem. And now let's, sorry, let's get into parametric shortest paths, okay? So the only difference here, if you note, is that the edge weights are now linear functions of lambda, okay? Think of lambda as time, and the amount of traffic on each road is varying as a linear function of time. So correspondingly, the cost of each path is also now a linear function of time, all right? So still, the problem remains the same. You want to find what the shortest path is, and uh, now it's no longer that straightforward. So you can't even compare these anymore. So now the problem is said to be parameterized by lambda, okay? So lambda there is known as the parameter, and this is known as, as the parametric shortest path problem. Okay, and so for fixed values of lambda, this reduces to the earlier problem. So if you fix, say, lambda equals zero, you substitute lambda equals zero in these six equations, and you find that P2 is the shortest path. Then suppose you substitute lambda equals one, and again, still P2 is the shortest path. Then you substitute lambda equals two, and the shortest path changes to P1, and so on. And this is what we want to find in general, that how many times can this shortest path change with different values of lambda, okay? So yeah, this is the problem description. Uh, any questions so far? Okay. Uh, so yeah, there is, uh, this sounds like a very practical problem, but there's one small, this thing. So note that uh, once we fix a value of lambda, throughout the graph, we substitute that same value of lambda. But that is not true in practice. In the sense, suppose you start from home at lambda equals five, when you reach the next node, lambda need not be five anymore, it has changed and so on. However, in, uh, in 2011, it was shown that whatever results we prove in this setting is also applied to the other setting. The other setting meaning that uh, now your path won't be just the sum of the edges on it, it will be the composition. Because when you go to the next edge, the lambda you feed into that has to be the one coming from the previous edge, and so on. Okay, so we'll be just, uh, yeah, let me say that we'll be just working with this setting, and that's it. So yeah, let's look at this more pictorially. Now, uh, we'll plot lambda on the x-axis, and the cost of the, since the cost of the path is varying, we'll plot it on the y-axis. And since they are linear functions of lambda, the cost of a path will be a simple straight line. So the path P1, this is what the function looks like. For the path P2, this is what the function looks like. In this, note that at lambda equals zero, P1 is the shortest path, and it continues to be the shortest path for some time until P, where P1 and P2 intersect, and at that point, P2 takes over. The important thing to note is that beyond that point, P1 can never be a shortest path, okay? Because these are basically just straight lines. They intersect at one point, and once P2 becomes shorter, it continues to be shorter for all higher values of lambda. This point will be important later on. 
so now, yeah, this is P3, P4, P5, P6, okay? And we can visualize the entire shortest path as a sequence, okay? Look at the lower envelope of this whole graph, okay? And in general, this will always be a piecewise linear concave function. So in this case, this piecewise linear concave function has five pieces because five of the paths are part of shortest path. And the sixth path, if you notice the one at the top, uh, P4 over there, that is never a shortest path. Okay, so what we are interested in is the number of different shortest paths. So in this case, there are five. And another way to count that is the number of breakpoints. Breakpoints is where one shortest path yields to another. Okay, so the number of shortest paths is basically just one more than the number of breakpoints. So you can, you can count either one. And formally speaking, uh, this is defined by the term phi. So phi is known as the parametric shortest path complexity. For this talk, we'll know it just, we'll call it just the parametric complexity, okay? And if you're given a graph G, you're given S and T, and you're also given the linear edge weight assignments, then phi of G comma W is simply the number of breakpoints or the number of uh, different shortest paths. And what we're interested in is, sorry, is maximizing this over all possible graphs. So when I talk of phi of n, it means fix a, a positive integer n, look at all possible graphs on n vertices, look at all possible weight assignments for those graphs, and what is the maximum number of breakpoints you get? That is phi of n. So any question? Okay, so uh, what was already known, let's see at known result. So, okay, the first basic thing is what I explained earlier is that a shortest path once abandoned cannot be reused. So once P2 replaces P1 as a shortest path, no time in the future will P1 ever come back. And this property is true not just for ST paths, but also for XY paths where X and Y are just any pair of vertices in the graph. This property is known as the alternation free property. And using this property in the year 1980, uh, Daniel Gusfield proved that phi of n is at most n raised to log n, okay? This means that for any n vertex graph, the number of different shortest paths you can have is at most n raised to log n. And he, this is all he used, the alternation phi property is all he used, okay? The next question is, is this tight? And the answer is yes. So uh, in 1983, Karst Tension showed a matching lower bound of n raised to log n. And 18 years later, Mulmule and Shah showed the same lower bound. Uh, it was inspired from Carstensen's work, but their graph, so a lower bound means they presented an explicit graph, okay? Uh, a graph for each n, and uh, their graphs were designed in such a way that you could represent the edge weights with uh, polylogarithmic -log many bits, all right? So when I say designing the graph, it means not just the, the graph, but also the linear weight functions on the edges. And their linear weight functions could be expressed in this way. Okay, that's for general graphs, so the problem is solved. N raised to log n is a lower bound as well as an upper bound. Let's get to planar graphs. So, Nikola Kernel, Brand, and Mitzenmaker in 2006, they showed a lower bound of linear in N, which is actually quite small considering that all the our upper bounds are like N raised to log n. And around 11 years later, it was shown that for a special case of planar graphs, so the PL there stands for planar, and the SP here stands for series parallel, okay? So for series parallel graphs, it was shown that this is actually uh, actually an upper bound as well. And this these were some of the reasons why it was believed that for planar graphs, the upper bound should be something like a polynomial in N, if not linear in N. And in the same work, they also conjectured. So this is known as Nikolova's conjecture because uh, it was, I mean, it was in this paper by these four people, but uh, it was part of Nikolova's thesis in 2009. And she conjectured that uh, for planar graph, this number is at most some bounded by some polynomial in N. And uh, for a long time, this was believed to be true. And when we started working on the problem, we also believed it was true. And we kept failing until we realized that the reason we were failing was that it was not true. So uh, yeah, this, this brings us to our main result. And that is that for planar graphs as well, you have the same lower bound of N raised to log N. And uh, uh, our proofs are highly inspired by uh, the Carstensen and the Mulmulesha constructions. And that's why we get the same bounds on our bit length, the bit lengths of our coefficients. Okay. 
Right. So, uh, so yeah, the, let me just once present the final landscape before I move on to the proof. So yeah, basically all upper bounds, all lower bounds are uh, uh, n raised to log n, and down there that's our contribution. Okay. Uh, any questions? Okay. Good. So yeah. Uh, uh, okay. So why were uh, uh, Nikolova et al. studying this problem? They had. They were. Uh, it was a similar related problem to the traffic problem I just described. They had a graph and on yeah, they had a deadline to meet. So you start from a particular vertex, and you have to get to another particular vertex uh, within a certain deadline, within a certain time. And every edge you take will incur certain amount of time delay, which is sorry, given by an independent Gaussian random variable. And your aim is to determine an ST path whose expected delay is uh, most likely to be less than the deadline. Okay. And what they showed is that this task can be solved in time n raised to log n. Now, in their algorithm, everything ran in polynomial time except the one step where uh, for planar graphs, they say that, uh, uh, the, they, they use the conjecture that for planar graphs, the parametric complexity is at most polynomial. But now that we know it's not, so their algorithm does not run in polynomial time. However, they, there could still be a polynomial time algorithm for this problem. Okay, so uh, yeah, before I show you the cylinder, so uh, if if at all Nikolova's conjecture is false, then there is a large alternation-free sequence. Uh, an alternation-free sequence is a sequence which has the property that for every two vertices, a path once abandoned is never reused. And uh, uh, so this is just a combinatorial property. It has nothing to do with the edge weights. So before we try to build a graph for uh, to refute Nikolova's conjecture, let's just look at a graph that is unweighted and has the alternation-free property. And even this was uh, not known for quite some time. And that's one of the reasons might be because we think of planar graphs as drawn on a flat surface or on a plane or on a two-dimensional surface. But sometimes it's easier to think of them as drawn on the surface of a cylinder. So this is the planar graph. Okay. So. Uh, the vertices are all on the surface of the cylinder. So this is called, this is the first layer. Each layer has six vertices. So the, the ones which are, the vertices which are thick, I'll call them the major layer. So this is a major layer followed by four minor layers, then another major layer followed by four minor layers and so on, okay? And S is connected to all the vertices in the first layer. T is connected to all the vertices in the last layer. And all edges go from left to right, okay? That's the direction. And for each, <coughs> notice that for each vertex, so let's, let's fix a vertex like this one. For each vertex, there are two options. You either go straight ahead or you go upwards, okay? So that's like a binary option and you'll see how this actually corresponds to uh, binary numbers. So uh, yeah, so basically if you want to construct a path, each vertex needs to know that if the path comes through me, which way do I send it? So uh, this has a nice uh, representation in terms of codes or numbers. So let's, uh, this is a specific example, but of course it can be generalized. So we'll look at, in general it is n digit, m digit numbers in base n. So we'll look at three digit numbers in base six. So just take a three digit number, 142 in base six, okay. And we'll show how this corresponds to a path. So what you do, you draw this uh, binary tree and well, upside down, uh, in the more uh, earthly way, the roots are at the bottom. So uh, Everything at this level, in the level of this guy, gets that number. Everything at the second level gets number four. Everything at the last level gets number two. Okay. And now, you go back to the cylinder. Beneath each uh, consecutive set of major layers, you have a number sitting there, right? And you assign the path according to that. So you can start the path from wherever you want. So I, we started from here. Here you see there's the number one. So one time you go along the body of the cylinder, and then you go straight until you hit the next major layer. Now you see a four, so one, two, three, four. Four times you go along the body and then you go straight. Then you see a one, then here you see a two, so twice you go along the body, then you go straight and so on. Okay, so this is how you construct a path, a particular path for a particular number. And now that paths can be represented in terms of numbers, turns out that when you just arrange the numbers in the normal, sorry, in the normal ascending order, then this particular arrangement of paths is an alternation-free sequence of paths. Okay? 
Uh, how much time? Three minutes. Left. Okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> so yeah, this is just the generalized form of the theorem. So okay, I won't go into the details of the proof. I'll only mention our contribution because a lo lot of our proof is inspired from uh, Carstensen and Mulmule and Shah. So uh, they conduct their, they construct their graphs inductively. Okay, and everything. Uh, the main thing that we need is something called a link gadget, which in their case is non-planar, but we need it obviously to be planar. So I'm skipping a lot of the details of their proof. Yeah, this is all the same as Mulmule and Sharp till this point. Now, so this is their link gadget. They, they, uh, it's something. Yeah, it is a bipartite graph, and it is non-planar. How we planarize is. is like this, wherever you connect them using straight lines, draw them on a piece of paper, separated by one unit, connect them using straight lines, and wherever two straight lines intersect, you add a new vertex. And this seems like a very naive and stupid thing to do, and why did Nikolova's conjecture seem, I mean, remain open for so long? The point is this directly does not work, because now you're getting new edges and new paths. Earlier, the only path between two vertices was this straight edge, because it's the only edge between these two. Now you get many sorts of paths, and you need to assign the edge weights more suitably. You can't just divide the edge weights in the proportion that they, uh, from the vertices that cut them. So we had to play around uh, with the constants, and we had to shift some of the edge weights to the earlier parts of the graphs and the later parts of the graphs. But turns out there is a particular weight assignment that works, and once our paths start looking, once uh, our paths start looking like edges in the Mulmulesha graph, we are done. And basically the same lower bound holds. Okay, good. So uh, yeah, so just an extension of these results. So so far in the entire proof, uh, uh, whatever I mentioned, our edge weights were linear polynomials in lambda. Uh, what if uh, you are looking at what if they are uh, uh, the cost of the roads are degree d functions of time? Okay, and turns out it's not much more than what you would get for linear anyway. So n raised to log n is the same as before. Earlier you had something plus a constant. Here we had plus something which is barely a super constant. This is the inverse Ackermann function, and for any practical value of n, it is at most five. And the proof is quite simple. We use something called Davenport Schindel sequences, and uh, it uses the fact that, of course, these sequences, the, the paths are no longer alternation free, but the number of alternations are limited by the degree of the polynomial. Okay. Uh, one more result is what if there are uh, there is more than one variable. Suppose there are two lambdas. If there are two lambdas, then turns out it's the same as one lambda. If there are three lambdas, then the problem becomes a little non-trivial, and we show that the n raised to log n becomes n raised to log square n. Okay, and the proof techniques are: we view the edges now as vectors in a three-dimensional space, and um, every so now since these are vectors, we can talk about the convex hull of these vectors. And turns out, when you take the convex hull of these vectors. The points that are the extreme points are, are uh, typically the ones that are the shortest paths. And then we use ideas from Minkowski sums and convex sums. OK, so yeah, that's our work. I'll just uh, stop with this. So basically, this is not part of our uh, uh, the Fox paper, but I would just like to mention it because it's uh, so interesting. So basically, uh, we were trying, what was the aim? So planar graphs were believed to have low parametric complexity because they have a small number of edges, they have a small number of faces and all that, right? And clearly that was not the right measure. Number of edges is not the right measure. So what is the right measure? Like, when can you just look at the topology of a graph and conclude that it has a high parametric complexity or a low parametric complexity? And it seems like three weights is the right measure. So uh, by a result of uh, Chekori and Chezoy, every graph of a certain tree width contains a certain size grid minor. And these grid minors are planar, okay? So in this planar graph, we just embed our graph. And if the tree width is large enough, it means that the parametric complexity is large enough. And another result we have, along with Pranavendu Mishra, is that uh, if the tree width is small enough, in the sense if the tree width is a constant, then the parametric complexity is polynomial. OK, and yeah, uh, I think, uh, yeah, I think I'll stop here. Thank you.
So I think we can ask a question. Maybe meanwhile, uh, the next speaker can prepare. Okay, so there is a question here. The cylinder example did not have, cons uh, oh, okay, that is depending on N and M. So in the cylinder example, there was, so if you expand the cylinder out, it's a N cross M grid graph. Yeah. So it's an N by six. Yeah, so in that example, the N was six and the M was three, and it had two raised to three, this thing. Oh, no, so in general, it, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the cylinder example is not actually an example for a high parametric complexity. It's for high alternation free sequencing. Okay, other questions? No? So thanks again.